Well, good morning. Good morning. Uh, I have a special, special treat for you this morning. There's a young man by the name of Cameron uh, who has been attending Echo Church since 2012 and um, faithfully serving in multiple areas of the church. Um, and then he uh, has begun preparing himself the uh, last two and a half years for ministry. And so he's faithfully going through a course of study for his bachelor's degree and Christian education and so and theology. And so we're, he's doing that right here through Echo Church, preparing himself. And he's been slowly we, giving him opportunities to speak on Wednesday night. So last Wednesday night, he shared a message that I thought would, it's going along with us in Romans. He'll, he'll be kind of repeating the same verses I did last week. Um, and so, uh, but I heard the message Wednesday, and I thought, that's just too good to not share it with the rest of the church. And so I asked him to share. And so, uh, would you just give a hand to him as he comes up here? Yeah, yeah, good. So before I begin, I'm actually going to open us up in prayer. And before I do that, um, when I was asked on Wednesday night, many people have come to me and said, Cameron, how nervous are you? Or are you nervous? And the answer to that is, of course, I'm nervous. But it's not how many people would think how nervous because of the people that are there, but it's because of how heavy the scripture is. And in today's culture, and we're going to be talking about it, and this is part of the heaviness that's going to come from it, is the truth that comes from this scripture has to be handled correctly in context and not fluffed up. And it's a hard, hard thing to hear, especially today, but it's just as hard to preach it as well. So before we begin this, I'm going to pray, and then we're going to do a short and sweet review to ensure that everybody is still on the same page. Those in small groups, we have covered this intensely, so we know. And those that are not in small group, this is the time to catch up on the fundamentals and the basics of what we're going to do so we're all on the same page before we begin. So if you bow your heads, Lord, thank you just for the opportunity you've given me to prepare this message. And if it wasn't for you... This message would not be anything special because the glory is on you as the last song. You are worthy of it all. And not once did I see in those lyrics my name. Because all that matters is you and to glorify you and not to glorify ourselves. And amen. So we're going to be looking at Romans 8, 23 through 27. And we covered this last week as well. And the whole purpose is just to build the foundation and to remind ourselves what scripture says and where we've been. So let's read 23 through 27. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, which is talking about believers, who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is not seen, I'm sorry, now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he sees? But he, sorry, but if we hope for what we do not see, we wait with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words, and he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. So I start at verse 23 to remind us that there are three groanings that are happening. There's the groaning of creation, there's the groaning of believers, and there's groaning of the Holy Spirit. Pastor Sean took um, some time last week to really dig into this, and it's very important. I'm not going to go through it all again, but we need to remember that there's three specific groanings for three specific purposes. You see, in verse 23, it talks about what Paul's talking about as believers are 
the same result of sin, not just affecting humans, but humanity. Creation groans because of, they were subjected to what happened back in Genesis. Okay, Creation had nothing to do with what Adam's decision was. But God subjected creation to be under the curse. But the good news that is also talked about is if God subjects it, there, he finishes it. The perfect plan of God from the beginning to the end. There's hope at the end for creation. But we ourselves can look forward to the day of our redeemed body, the glorification that comes for a believer. No more pain as we experience here, no more sorrow, but most importantly, a heart that is broken here on earth will be restored to its fullness. That sounds like good news because the older you get and if you are young, you will soon realize that at one point in your life you could spring out of bed and just run, and now if you spring out of bed, you might throw out a hip. It's very, very, very important to know that these bodies are not forever. It's important, and it's good news. We also see that it says first fruits. Now, there is a pastor that had a pretty interesting quote that I would like to share. It said, just as the first piece of produce to appear on a tree provides hope of a future harvest, the fruit which the Spirit produces in us now gives the believer hope to look forward to. We know as a believer that the hope is not what we see now. It is not what we can get now. It's what's to come. We see the words waiting, patience, Anybody that is not patient like myself knows the one thing you don't pray for is patience because it does exactly what you do not want it to do, which is give you opportunities for patience. We know that because God has a perfect plan for believers, what was subjected will be finished. We also know that if God does the saving, then it's because of God's purpose. And if God does the saving with God's purpose in mind, it means God will fulfill it by redeeming a believer. God does the work. And the good news behind this is if God does the saving, we don't save ourselves. We have nothing to do with it. There's not a negotiation. There's not signing of a contract, and we have to worry about the small fine print at the end. And the good news is if we could save ourselves, we could get that saving taking away. If God is perfect, according to the Bible, that we all believe, right? He does the saving. He, there is no mistake. You're his forever. And we can stand with confidence as Paul is talking here. Now, yes, you are his forever. You will be transformed when you get the call on your life to be in God's family. So does that mean once you're saved forever... That you can just live however you want? Absolutely not. Because true salvation comes with transformation. And if you think you're saved and there was never a transformation, you look like everyone else that's not a believer, we need to look at ourselves. Because that's a huge problem. Mainstream Christianity will say, you can say a prayer and you can walk out the same person as you came in. There is no difference. And I want to say if there's no transformation and you call yourself a believer, we need to look because maybe we're deceiving ourselves. A new nature that comes with transformation comes a new mindset, new desires. And you should be able to say before you were saved and called by God, you were once this person but who you are now is a completely different person. If the person before God called me back in 2019, we were at a media worship retreat from this church. And in this, I walked in, served in the church as an unbeliever, or what I will get to as a make-believer. And what we will soon figure out and soon realize is the person, if it's true salvation, the person you were before you were called by God and who you are now probably would never hang out if it was two individuals. And it's so dramatic, the change and the transformation, that it is two different people. And if it's not, we need to question it. You see, we learn that the new desire is holiness, not hope, 
hopelessness. Because the world will offer something like hopelessness with a little bit of a pause between hope and lessness. Because it can offer hope in one season, but in the next, it can be the biggest burden, the biggest headache. But the hope that God gives to a redeemed believer, or not a redeemed believer, but a believer that is looking forward to that redeemed body will withstand any hardship, any pain that comes our way because it is solid, not flimsy, like the hope the world gives today. About a month ago, I was able to uh, preach from 18 through 37 um, an overall view to the reverb um, on Wednesday. And something that I compared to the hope that will withstand and will not is simply comparing hopelessness is what the world offers people today. We look at money, and money can come and go. We look at the hope of a believer. It says, waiting, eager. It's not right now. The world will offer something that looks good and will never satisfy anyone. Back in 2019 was a lot for me. I started a new job, completely got out of the welding field and went into a, a plumbing field. I uh, felt this call to ministry, something that I did not really want to do. So I did welding. I was miserable. But then we also had this retreat where God really got a hold of my heart. And the person that I was before I left for that retreat, when I came back to work, I would be called the Jesus freak, the weirdo. And many people would say, what's wrong with you? You're different. We were once friends, and now I don't want to have anything to do with you. The transformation changes everything. So then I had to encounter people that would purposely come and maybe not even buy anything or not ask any questions and try to disprove my belief. So there's this little thing called apologetics. And it, I actually wrote in here, I had to study apologetics. Because there's two folds to apologetics, if you really want to be able to understand. And the first and foremost that every Christian in this room should be able to have, but not many people can, is what and why do you believe? What do you believe and why do you believe it? And can you answer that question just like that when someone comes to you in opposition? If you don't know that, you can't know apologetics because that's the fundamental. That is the foundation. But then when you are understanding of that, you have fullness of why and what you believe. Then comes comparing. Apologetics is comparing claims. So what someone says, you need to compare it with what the world offers. Many people will say Christianity is just a fairy tale. And I laugh at that. Because people don't get offended when they talk about the tooth fairy or Santa Claus. Why? But that's not the direction I'm going to go. The direction I'm going to go is something that correlates with the hope from a believer that I hear to this day. And it's Christianity is just a crutch to get through life. Christianity is just a way to endure life until we die. And from just the surface level of that, it looks very worrisome for someone to have to talk about that. But if you actually dig deeper and you compare the claim that Christianity is just a crutch, let's compare it to what the world does. Many people will get off work and go straight to the convenience store and drink their life away to endure life to the end, which leads to depression which will ruin their life, and in one moment might sound like a good idea, the next, they're an alcoholic. They can't even have a job any longer. They depend it on something that will never give them full hope and never fulfill any desire. People will compare Christianity to a drug addict getting their fix. And anyone that knows is when you start with one drug, it goes completely out of hand. The hope in one season will destroy your life in the next. And we need to know as believers 
What do we place our hope in? Because the hope that we might have that's not biblical and not God will probably destroy our life in the long run. Now, Cameron, being an alcoholic and drug addiction, that's extreme. Okay, let, let's do impulsive buying, something that doesn't seem harmless, that you fill a void of your unhappy life just by spinning what you want. But then what happens when you don't have money? Then you become unhappy, depressed. Just like a drug addict, they will isolate themselves from the world. The one thing that we can stand on is what the truth and what God has said in his word. And in today's culture that everybody wants a word, if you truly 100% want to understand what God has said, you need to open his word and quit following or pursuing a man saying they're speaking for the Lord. It's business time. It's time to get serious. Because there's only one way to heaven. And the Bible's clear on that. There's no side cuts or shortcuts to get to heaven. There is one way. And it does not matter what the world says. There's only one truth. Because if there's one way, there has to be one truth. If there's multiple truths, then what is true? The Bible is very clear on this. And most importantly, there's only one true source of hope that can withstand life. Now we're going to weasel on over to human weakness, or it actually says weakness here, but we are weak. Believers, make believers, unbelievers, we are all spiritually weak because we are human. We have this self-centered mindset of, just think through this past week, really look internally here. Have you said anything like, if I'm going to do this, then what's the benefit that I'm going to return from it? I deserve this. We might say one thing, don't do this, but we'll do it five minutes later because we're hypocrites, right? I think all of us in this room can think and hear this and say, I did this this day because I go through this list and I can see when, where, and almost what time I have done these things myself this week. You see, it's so easy for us to get distracted as believers. It's so easy for us to look at the culture today and not just look at the culture today, but get molded and form to what culture says. I'm going to say four things, and I want us to think internally. Do I believe this? Have I said this before in my life? And how recent? Because the people I hang out with at work, in my inner circle, outside of work, out in my inner circle, outside of work, I hear these things every day from peers, from grown adults, from the younger generation, and it's a problem. If I do good, karma has to repay me. That's a work-based mindset that is actually getting into the churches today, that are in the churches today. We talk about... God saves not because of works, so anyone can boast. Well, in this, many people, especially in Christianity today, believe that if they do good, karma has to repay them. But if we believe God to be the God of the Bible, there's no room for karma. It's a man-made thing to justify people. Or we will hear, I am what my astrology sign is. You see, when I was preparing this message for the youth... I think about when I was their age or when I first got saved. I was not solid in my biblical reading. I pursued things, and we'll get into that. You see, it doesn't matter what any astrology sign or what other people say about you. What does God say about you? Because at the end, it doesn't matter what other people say. It doesn't matter what other people outside of the culture, outside of the church say about you as a Christian. What does God say about a believer? Because that matters. It has to be good if everyone else does it. Oh, man, parents love to use that card, don't they? The, oh, are you going to jump off a bridge with all your friends? Absolutely not. I'm afraid of heights. And it sounds ridiculous when you really think about it. Like, that would really bother me. Like, that's ridiculous. 
But I view when we are talking about this matter, God probably looks at it the same way. And as a believer, that's actually, if we're rooted in the Word of God, when we hear these things, we think, this is ridiculous. This sounds ridiculous. But what's even more ridiculous that many, many people of today, especially in churches, will say is it has to be okay to do if it's not illegal. And I would like to say what the church says and what the Bible says is final authority. It doesn't matter what the government says. It doesn't matter what our officials say. And we need to come to the fact that if we believe our officials more than the word, we need to reexamine ourselves. Because this culture can shift our focus from what God has called us to do to what we think the church wants us to do. And there's a huge difference. Huge difference. We often have this mentality of thinking about if I do something good, what is in it for me? We are weak. Even if we are saved, because not everybody that makes up a church is saved, and we're going to get into that. But what we need to understand right now, to understand where we're about to go, is even in this weakness for a believer, the Spirit is there to help. We are weak, and just because we are saved does not mean we're not weak anymore. Our human nature will be influenced by what we listen to, what we hear, and what we watch. The culture is very, very into molding people of today. So what do we spend our time doing throughout the week? But the good thing is, even in our prayer, the Spirit will alter our prayer and guide us to what the will of God is, because that's all that matters. It doesn't matter about how long our prayer is. It doesn't matter if we have some catchy, tweetable prayer. None of that matters, because the Spirit's there. It also means that nothing that we say will ever dictate, because the Spirit is aligned with the Word of God. We need to remember today in the church that God does the saving and it has nothing to do with what we do or what we say. In James 4, 3, you ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. How many of our prayers are that? I can tell you a lot. Personally, when we look at the church, I want us, especially what we're about to get into here in a bit, I want us to look inwardly and not who's sitting next to us. Because oftentimes, I will be sitting there like, oh, X, Y, or Z needs to hear this message. No, I need to. It doesn't matter who's sitting next to me. It matters, are you understanding what's being said? Conviction will come, and that's okay for a believer. But ignoring conviction is absolutely unacceptable for a believer. Now that we understand this basic, foundational, and we're all on the same page now, Now we're going to move in. Remember, we're talking about believers here. And about a month ago, when I was preparing for a message for Wednesday night, I listened to a pastor that most people in the church, when they think of believers versus unbelievers, which we just did this whole spirit versus flesh deal, we think of the pagans that sleep in on Sunday. We think of the pagans that cuss, drink, smoke, do all these bad things, but not the ones in the church. We need to focus in the church because there are believers that come in faithfully every Sunday just like there are make-believers that fill up the church as well. If we look at Matthew 7, it is the biggest scary verse, in my opinion, that we will stand before the Lord and we will hear, Depart from me, for I never knew you. And then people begin to justify themselves by saying things like, I prophesied in your name, Lord. I casted out demons in your name, Lord. I grew a church double the size, Lord. But the problem with mainstream Christianity and the problem with most of us today is we, are, we start with I, And we sprinkle in God or Jesus at the end to make us look holy and godly. 
It has nothing to do with us. In Matthew 13, the parable of the good and the bad seed, Jesus speaks to the servant about the kingdom of God and that there's good seed and there's bad seed. We also see that Jesus tells the servant not to pluck the weeds early, wait till the harvest time. Because the good seed and the bad seed will look very, very similar. A make-believer will look very, very similar to a believer. That we can, as a make-believer, act our way through church. And we might give our best performance by acting. But at the end of the day, when the harvest time comes, Jesus makes it clear that those that are bad seeds, when they're ripped up from the ground and you can see the truth at the end, will be casted away. Because the purpose of the good seed had a specific purpose, a specific reason it was planted, and the bad seed is not welcomed. You see, Jesus is showing in this parable is what the church is today, believers versus make-believers. But when it comes judgment day, those that act their way through life in the church will have the final spotlight shined on them And the truth will come out, and there's no acting from that. If we look at John 15, 1 through 17, Jesus speaks about he is the vine, and God's the vine dresser. The good on the vine will stay because it abides in the Father, and the bad will be cut off. And what we can understand about these parables here is that the fruit that is produced in a believer's life has nothing to do with us but to glorify God. And if we prepare a message to glorify ourselves, it's wrong. If we sing on stage to glorify ourselves, it's wrong. And if we come to church to glorify ourselves, I go to church, it's wrong. It's God bidding the glory. And the reason I share these today is I believe most of us know that there are believers and make-believers in a church. But what we need to know is not look who's next to us and who's around and pinpoint who those are and who they're not. I think we need to go through and listen to this and look inwardly and like, is this me? Am I true? Because we need to ask ourselves this on a daily basis. And let's go to the Holy Spirit. What did Jesus say? I often say the one phrase that just drives me up a wall is when people talk about what would Jesus do. People will manipulate that. And it sounds good from the surface, but I think we need to also focus not just on what he did, but what Jesus says. Because I think that's important that many people rob. You see, Jesus speaks on the Holy Spirit in John 14, 26, and 27. says the Holy Spirit, he teaches. He also teaches. He gives peace. And he also intercedes for a believer. This is for believers. Now, for full transparency, where we're going to go next is the part that just is the heaviest burden on me. Because it's not easy to talk about, but we need to talk about it. Because ignoring an issue of what the churches have today does nobody good but the heretics that are out there teaching it. And those that sit in the pews that are going straight to hell because they don't even know what the gospel is. This is hard to hear, but it's hard to also speak on. And when it came to Wednesday, the truth And the reality is in today's culture, in today's world, we want to justify our sin. And most importantly, that's uncalled for anymore, is we want personal truths to matter more than what actual truth is. And as much as I hate to say it, when I go to the doctor and they tell me I'm overweight, I don't want to hear that. But it's true. When a four-year-old kid this tall wants to get on a roller coaster and they say, nope, not too big. It's not unloving to say any of that. It's actually to help. 
So as we go through this again, for full transparency, when I first had, when, when God saved me, I had no structure, I hung out with the wrong crowd, and everything I'm about to talk about has affected me. And I had to go and unlearn a lot of lies by actually opening up the word because the one thing in these movements that they do not talk about is opening your word. Because when you open the word and you see the truth, the darkness in most of these ministries that are not God-centered but man-centered, they don't want the truth to be exposed. This is going to be heavy. It's heavy on me. But it's necessary to talk about. You see, in today's culture, people will take this specific Romans passage, the groaning of the Spirit, to justify a whole denominational difference. You see, Romans 8.26, it says the Spirit groans too deep for words. And there are denominations out there that will use that to justify that speaking in tongues is the salvific. If you don't speak in tongues, you're not saved. Okay? Interesting. Which then they bring people to the altar, shake them, pray for them, lay hands on them. And if you don't speak in tongues, you're not saved. You have a little faith, they say. You don't have the spirit, they say. Some people will leave and never come back because of that. And some people will speak gibberish and put on a big show. It's a problem. And the biggest problem that I have is I was looking through the Gospels and I was looking at Scripture and I could not find Jesus telling people to come to the altar. We're going to lay hands on you. And those that speak in tongues are going to go to the right and those that don't are going to go to the left. And those on the right that speak in tongues are my children. I don't know where that says that. And I think I know why. Because it's out of context robbing God and robbing the scripture from what its true meaning is. To push an agenda that it never had anything to do with. You see, there's this common theme, what we're going to see, is it's man-centered theology and not God-centered what we see in these big movements called the prosperity gospel, that their sole focus, their foundation is not on the word of God or what it says or what it means, but their foundation is on sowing seeds and prosperity and getting things in return. Some will say the truth of repentance in the Greek is called receipt because when you do something as in tithing, you give God the receipt and he will pay you double. It's heresy. If we call ourselves ministries and we call ourselves pastors, we need to start handling the Word of God correctly because those that are faithful look like a bunch of idiots just like them. And I know that word is very hard to hear, but that's exactly how people look at Christianity because of this. It's a problem. We see that their hope is what they can get now. Money, healing, but what we know from Scripture is the hope for a believer is not that. Jesus did not say, come to me, all the disciples, and we are going to get famous. That's really relevant on all these social media platforms for kids. Getting famous. Being an influencer. Getting money. Having all these things. No, Jesus said to the disciples, you follow me, it will cost you your life. And if we look into how the disciples' lives ended. A lot of them were murdered. It cost you everything. And if a ministry says it will not cost you anything, but you will gain a lot more that you can get now, it's not a ministry at all. One of the big wigs of the prosperity movement will say, and this is a quote, God will begin to prosper you, for money always follows righteousness. Then we have these ministries that center focus on healing. And these are two quotes from a big wig in the healing ministry. There will be no sickness for the saints of God. If your body belongs to God, it does not and cannot become sick. 
heresy. The reason people lose their healing is because they begin questioning if God really did it. Why is the center focus on you have little faith, you don't believe enough, it's all about you. But not in the Bible have I read that it's all about us. Everything from the Old Testament to the New is to do one purpose, and that's glorify God. Does our lives glorify God? It's an interesting question to think about. And not every question that is proposed in small groups on the pulpit have to be answered because it is our responsibility to struggle with it and to seek the Word of God and figure it out ourselves and not get spoon-fed anymore. There is this big, there is this big ministry that is taking deep roots in America today. And it's the casting out demons from believers and non-believers life. They will say things like, you have a spirit of alcoholism, you have a spirit of adultery, where sin isn't really even relevant to a believer's life. It's just a spirit that needs to be casted out of them. But before we got into Romans, let's not forget where we just came from, which was 1 John. And it's very clear that 1 John said this, that you are either walking in darkness or you're walking in light. There is no red, there is no blue. It's clear. And it's hard to talk about. But the truth of the matter is, are we walking in darkness or are we walking in light? Because in 1 John it says where light is, darkness cannot be. So let's be honest. You will hear things just as those spirits, but the thing that just like really upsets me the most is those with mental disabilities have a demon in them. And it's ridiculous, it's not biblical, and it must be called for what it is. It's a problem that even most of us in here may believe or have came from. And this is never to bash anyone in here because it's hard. But we need to seek the God of the Bible to understand the truth. Because there's many people that profess that they believe in God, but it's the one they make up from their imagination that has nothing to do with the Bible. And we need to understand, what does the Bible say? So then I know many people here are going to be like, well, Cameron, does that mean you don't believe in healing? You don't believe in deliverance? You don't even believe in miracles. And I would say I believe in deliverance. I believe in miracles. I believe all that stuff. But who defines the terms? It's God. You see, for me, it was easy to get sucked into this healing ministry where a group of us would go and lay hands on people at Walmart. And people would ask, why does Jesus love me? And nobody would know. Because our agenda was to heal, manipulate, and use adrenaline to show that God really loves people. But in reality, I didn't care if it really showed anything good about God. It had to be good about me. It's easy to want to be a part of something big for God. It's easy to get wrapped up in wanting prosperity now. It's easy, especially with the life that we live. We want things easier. But the truth is, what did Jesus say and what did he preach? And there's many things that Jesus taught, but I'm going to give three that I think are very important that we need to understand when we compare these movements. You see, Jesus taught that salvation comes only from the Lord. In today's culture, we want to say it's called universalism, where there's multiple ways and multiple paths. But there's only truly one way, and it's true. Jesus spoke a lot about the kingdom of God, and throughout our day, how much do we talk about it? Do we talk about our faith when we're at work? With our friends, family? Something to think about. 
And Jesus also spoke and taught that he is the Messiah from the Old Testament. In this culture that only wants to read the New Testament because the Old Testament is hard. It's not hard. And we need to understand that. So Cameron, do you believe in deliverance? Absolutely. I believe in miracles, signs and wonders. But God defines terms. I do not believe in any of that. That is a part of mainstream Christianity, TV, media outlets, growing people's legs, healing people instantly. I believe the greatest miracle of all times that happened today, and we can read and go back and familiarize ourselves with Romans 8, chapter 1. That the old nature destined to go to hell, the old nature that had nothing to do with God, it actually says in Romans 8, remember that we were enemies of God. That even through that, God saves a sinner that's destined for condemnation and makes them part of the family. That's the greatest miracle of any time. And I honestly think with the whole blessing and prosperity movement, that's the best blessing anybody can get, that their soul is forever his. That's the only thing that matters and not what we can get today. We need to remember that God defines the terms, not us, not pastors. And the thing that I kind of skipped over, but we're just going to say it anyways. The whole make-believers versus the believers are not just you sitting out there. There are many make-believers that get up on Sunday, behind the pulpit, walk around, and just share 45-minute stories that have nothing to do with God, nothing to do with the Bible, but they call themselves a church and they call themselves a pastor. Make-believers are not just those that listen, but those that preach. We need to test. But most importantly, we need to be in our word. And that's all I got today, but I did, I did have something in my notes at the end here that I will say this, and it's because the truth of the matter is many people say, man, this was a great, great message for the youth because they're so influenced. But oftentimes and stat-wise, the most mature Christians are the kids because the older you get, the more baggage you get and the more of a a foggy lens you have over reading things. It's just as important as the kids need to hear this, it's just as important as the adults need to hear this. So I'm going to pray us out and I'll be done. Um, if you have questions, questions are great. But seek what the Word says first before you start going to man. Because you can ask me many, many questions. You can ask anybody on staff a question and we could get it wrong. But the truth is the Bible will not be wrong. It's serious business that needs to be taken care of. Regardless of where we are.